Hello and welcome to the Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Battle Cat, an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, produced by Filmation Studios. One of the first things to note about this episode is that it was originally supposed to be a part of the 1984 batch of episodes. For those that don't know, He-Man's second season took place across two years, 33 episodes that were produced and aired in 1984 and a remaining 32 episodes that were produced and aired in 1985 alongside the debuting She-Ra series. Originally, He-Man's second season was only going to be 39 episodes. When the decision was made to expand the series by one more year due to the billion dollar success of the brand, a few episodes were held back. This episode is one of them. Another episode held back was Origin of the Sorceress. Actually, if you pick up issue one of the Marvel Star Masters of the Universe comic, you will see the trade ads for the debuting 1985 season, as well as the debuting She-Ra series. Rather wonderfully, the debuting episode of the 1985 series, Origin of the Sorceress, was immediately followed by the first episode of She-Ra, Into Etheria. Hopefully, I shouldn't have to explain to you the connection between those two episodes. For those interested, this series has numerous crossovers, at least in terms of production, with Star Trek. Many writers and artists for Filmation were huge fans of the Star Trek show and did their best to pay homage. Of course, one of the most instantly recognisable Star Trek things about He-Man and She-Ra is the sound effects library. Most famously, the blast from He-Man's sword is the sound of the Enterprise's photon torpedo. And why am I bringing up Star Trek? Well, the writer of this episode is Star Trek's incredibly famous and supremely talented Dorothy Fontana, or DC Fontana to use one of her more recognisable pen names. This episode starts off as a somewhat average feeling episode with Orko once more up to mischief. Though he does claim, as we will find out, that it's all for a good reason, much to the confusion of his friends. I talked in my commentaries for Diamond Road Disappearance and Teela's Quest about the fraught relationship between Man at Arms and Orko, and I said how Duncan slowly softens to Orko as the series progresses. This is not a fine example of that, as Man at Arms is incredibly quick and short tempered with Orko here. I always do like the fact that Man at Arms and Prince Adam just seem to hang out at the Royal Palace. Of course, this can be traced back to their earliest appearances in the DC Comics Masters of the Universe limited series, as Man at Arms was very much his mentor in those stories. In the Filmation series, while still his mentor, Man at Arms grew to become more of a confidant, helping Prince Adam make sense of his responsibilities as the most powerful man in the universe. This scene presents Orko as a somewhat mischievous child, which truthfully is not my favourite take on the character. I always prefer when writers would present Orko far more seriously. Yes, still a court jester, but not a joke. Some writers love to present him as a child that needed to be educated, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't a stretch of the imagination to believe this to be the case, but when he was scolded it slightly undermined the character. Let us not forget, in the episode Dawn of Dragoon and some other Trollon based episodes, Orko is presented as the most powerful wizard in his own dimension. Thinking about it, one of the earliest examples of Orko being written as a child, actually very much a child, is Daymar the Demon. If you go back to season 1 and watch that episode, you'll probably be shocked at how childlike Orko is written. Other times writers would present him as the voice of the children. One of the most annoying Orko appearances is in the episode Trouble's Middle Name. Writer J. Michael Straczynski has him play an important role in the episode, but as the story progresses, Orko is literally reduced to nothing but an expositional voice explaining to the audience what is happening on screen. And here we see mischievous Orko defying orders. Having been warned not to play with the chemicals, he once again decides to play with the chemicals. And again, he believes his reasoning is sound, hoping to make Cringer brave. It's rather bizarre how this episode turns into an origin story for Cringer and his eventual transformation into Battle Cat, but we'll get there. I always think it's rather cruel that Orko glues Cringer's paws to the ground, making it impossible for him to escape Orko's crazed plans. Another thing to point out is that at this point in the series, the animators are more than familiar with how to animate Orko. In my previous commentaries, I talked about how in his earliest appearances, the animators were struggling how to move the character on screen and at times, even how he should look from shot to shot. By season two, certain directors were fond of giving Orko a great deal of smooth squash and stretch animation. At Filmation, different animators had different strengths and so the directors would specify that certain animators work on certain scenes. In the case of Orko, there would have been particular artists that were far better at animating his weirdness than others. The thing about this scene that is somewhat surprising is that even though people are in danger, Prince Adam does not transform into He-Man. 
I'm sure that in some instances he would be all too ready to unsheathe the sword of power and call upon the power of Greyskull, but methinks given that we're going to see a very important noteworthy transformation sequence later in the episode, DC Fontana probably decided to leave the sword sheathed on this occasion. And so we're about to enter the origin story of how Cringer came to be Battlecat, and one has to point out that as awesome as this story is, it's a very flimsy reason for telling the story. Orko misbehaves and disobeys an order, and so Man Arms decides to tell a lengthy story about how once upon a time, Prince Adam and Teela disobeyed an order and released the dreaded Gedge from its tomb. Don't get me wrong, I like this episode a great deal, but the entry point for this flashback feels so bizarre. Here we see a young Prince Adam, actually it's a shame that we don't see the younger version of Man at Arms that we saw in Teela's Quest, or maybe at least a slightly younger one than we see on screen in this flashback. Actually, this is the first time since Creatures from the Tar Swamp that we have seen a young Prince Adam, and we're of course also going to see a young Cringer once more. And he is downright adorable. Keen-eyed fans will notice that this location the young Prince Adam finds himself in is the Valley of Power from the episode of the same name. However, here, the background is given a different name and presented as a completely different location, which is a shame. It's always nice when backgrounds match up and connections are made. And we see that Man at Arms has always been a talented inventor with the animal caller able to communicate rather effortlessly with the animals of Eternia. Something that will save Cringer's life. Interestingly, when the show was broadcast in the UK, due to the way cartoons were aired in the UK during the 80s on stations that ran ads, episodes had to be edited for time, and so every single episode of He-Man was missing a scene or two during its initial run. For example, in this episode, the scene in which Prince Adam encounters the Sabre Cat and saves Cringer's life was completely removed. Instead, Adam says, that call works, and we cut to his hand moving the plants aside to reveal the baby Cringer, thus removing the fact that Prince Adam saved Cringer's life. When the episodes were repeated in the UK from 1987 onwards, they thankfully remained uncut, though sometimes the moral segments were still removed. I'm sorry, but baby Cringer is just the cutest. Okay, maybe baby Simba from The Lion King may be the cutest of all time, but Cringer is definitely up there, right? His big eyes are just adorable. What is interesting about Baby Cringer in this episode is that he doesn't appear to be able to speak. Now, I'm more than okay with Cringer not speaking from the moment he meets Prince Adam. I feel that that would be kind of weird. It's just that in the flashback we saw in the episode Creatures from the Tar Swamp, the young tiger appears to be very well spoken. The structure of this flashback is very good, it has to be said. Scenes don't lag and the plot points are covered incredibly well. But as I said at the start, the reasoning for this flashback is so flimsy. But hey, we all love a good origin story, right? I think this does come down to one thing. The He-Man series puts itself in an awkward position by never having any real first episode. There is no inaugural story to explain how Adam became He-Man or how Skeletor became Eternia's villain. This lack of an explanatory first episode unfortunately makes Eternia's past a mystery. Formation writers occasionally wanted to dissolve that mysterious past by writing episodes that delve into the characters' histories. The difficulty though is in finding an excuse to tell them. In the past, explanatory flashbacks have always worked. The Mystery of Manny Faces and Fisto's Forest both tell origins through flashbacks. Each uses someone who is unfamiliar to give the regular cast an excuse to tell their friend's history. That method works with characters like Manny Faces, Fisto and even Mechanek because we too are unfamiliar with them. The 1985 origin stories, however, are a little more ambitious. This scene we learn how Cringer got his rather bizarre name and it's a young Teela that names him. I love that. In this scene Teela acts like the crowd ringleader with the other children but her mocking seems to be more of the big sister type than the schoolyard bully type. The last time we saw young Teela actually was in the episode Wizard of Stone Mountain in another flashback. Contrary to what I'm talking about the He-Man series was not full of flashbacks. This scene of the sorceress appearing to a young Prince Adam and Cringer is utterly beautiful. One would think that the glowing head of a woman would scare a child, but Adam reacts warmly. Hello, sorceress. It is implied that Adam is familiar with the sorceress and that she has been a presence in his childhood throughout the years. The guardian of Castle Greyskull has clearly been keeping a watch over the future He-Man for quite some time. Even though this part of the flashback is relatively short and contains few details, it still offers many ways to look at young Adam's life. In one script, DC Fontana single-handedly paints a picture of Adam's childhood. No other episode even scrapes the surface of his youth. 
All this history brings to mind the Masters of the Universe series Bible which outlines Prince Adam's years as he becomes He-Man. This episode Battle Cat does not follow the series Bible history line by line, mostly because this episode is an attempt to focus on Cringer's past rather than Adam's. The Bible dictates that Cringer was turned into Battle Cat the day that Adam first received the Sword of Power. DC Fontana avoids showing us this moment in Adam's history, which is a shame because it is probably the greatest scene never animated in the series. Instead, the writer skips the sorceress's bestowing of the Sword of Power on Prince Adam. Adam is left to explain that after becoming He-Man, he always made sure Cringer was not around when he transformed, showing that the secret identity really was a big deal. So Malactha shows up and his unnamed assistant who is called Alora in the script. It's a shame she didn't appear in any other episodes as she has a rather striking design. In a scene deleted, Malaktha and Laura discover the building which leads them to present themselves before King Randall and Queen Marlena. So yeah, Man Arms finally gets to the point of his story and begins talking about the archaeological dig that brought them to the Tikan jungle. This entire expedition is a plot kind of borrowed straight from the House of Shakoti two-parter. Those episodes also feature Malaktha bringing Prince Adam to a strange archaeological site where a temple holds an evil demon. A scene deleted in this part of the flashback had Cringer trying to hide himself in a backpack with, as you can imagine, very little success. Here we are a few years later and we're going to see Prince Adam and Teela interacting once more. Teela still picks on Adam for his Frady Cat but we sense the closeness of these two who have grown up together. Going back to what we saw earlier in the flashback, there is a sense that both Adam and Cringer are loners and that they need one another. No other episode depicts young Adam as a lonely child, but this one hints of it. Not only does Prince Adam go on the wilderness mission alone, but he also is separated from his peers when Teela and the boys mock his pet. There is a sense that Adam and Cringer need each other because they live in the world alone except for one another. This relationship carries straight into adulthood as they become even more private and secretive with the introduction of the Power Sword. And now we're in the new location, never before seen, the Tikan Jungle. Once more the filmation artists create a location that is unique, this one with vines that seem to have grown over many structures and objects. So now as we approach Act 2 we're finally going to see the reason that Man at Arms begins telling this story. Orko disobeyed Man at Arms leading to the chemical demon thing and many years earlier Prince Adam and Teela disobeyed Man at Arms in the past and had to pay a price for it. There is a thread that unites the two plots, but it is paper thin. Usually, when an incident in the present makes us think of an event in the past, the two events tend to share very obvious qualities. Man at Arms can think of a million times when people, including everyone from Prince Adam and Teela to King Randor himself probably, that have disobeyed him. It is a rather common occurrence since Man at Arms is such an impossible authoritarian. Because it is such a frequent occurrence, we have trouble understanding why Orko's mishap would lead to Duncan to think of Cringer's origin instantly. The two plot lines simply do not belong together. Imagine this instead, what if Cringer in the present day had gotten hurt somehow and while Prince Adam, Orko and Man at Arms wait in the hospital, they discuss how Cringer came to be at the Royal Palace in the first place. That storyline would have been the perfect background for Cringer's origin, the two plots merging seamlessly. The dual tales of this episode, Battle Cat, however, are painfully forced. It is this awkward melding that serves as this episode's only real weakness. I mentioned Origin of the Sorceress earlier. The flashback in that episode works in the context of the episode. The flashback here really does not. Actually, after hearing the first half of the story, Orko asks, I don't see what this has to do with me not listening to Man at Arm's warning, and we all find ourselves agreeing with Orko. All that said, the cringe origin is delightful, don't get me wrong. As we enter Act 2, the story threads slowly come together, though it would have been nice had they come together a tad quicker. Formation do a wonderful job in this scene by setting the mood, the music, there's something very unsettling. We know that something bad is on the horizon in the form of the creature within the temple, but the characters are completely unaware of it. Yet we still feel unease, truly wonderful direction. Plus the dialogue with Prince Adam and Man at Arms learning that the words evil and beware are associated with the temple really emphasise a sense of dread. It's actually surprising to see Ram Man show up in this episode. Part of me feels that he is somewhat out of place. There's very little humour in this flashback and as dramatic as Ram Man can be, see Robert Lamb's wonderful Not So Blind episode, his levity seems a little misplaced here. We're about to see the Gedge released. The script had a much slower, more menacing reveal. We were to have seen a wide angle shot of the temple with thunderous hammering coming from inside, causing everyone around to fall over as if they had been knocked down by the impact of an earthquake. 
we would then see the crack in the temple doorway slowly begin to widen as if under great pressure from inside. Another wide angle would have shown everyone present stepping back in fear just as the sealed doorway explodes. Interestingly, the Gedge in the script is very different to what we see here. In the script, the Gedge is described as a night black creature, ugly and very evil. As much as I like the design, the clothing on the creature does feel somewhat out of place. Almost a bit too modern for an ancient creature. As critical as I've been for the reasoning of this flashback, the remainder of this episode is simply fantastic with so many memorable moments occurring, as well as a fantastic action adventure scene. Oh, before I forget, Hal Sutherland, whose name you would always see in Season 1, stepped away from heavy production work during Season 2 of He-Man. However, he did return to He-Man to storyboard the odd episode here and there, uncredited. He storyboarded this particular episode, and you can really see some wonderful shots by an experienced visual artist in this episode, especially when we see Prince Adam about to transform into He-Man with Cringer looking on. It's an utterly wonderful shot and reveal. Even though we know the secret will be obvious for Cringer soon enough, we still feel some amount of excitement at seeing someone who does not know the secret discover it for the first time. By the power of Greyskull! After witnessing the transformation, the small Cringer wonders what is wrong with his best friend. A lovely piece of dialogue, easy Cringer, it's me, Adam, proves that he considers himself to be Adam first and He-Man second, as well he should. He-Man almost uncontrollably points the sword of power at Cringer, and the tiger transforms into Battle Cat for the very first time. And now it is He-Man's turn to be surprised, but he recalls what the sorceress prophesied long ago. He-Man finally realises what she meant all those years ago, and Battle Cat is finally born. Interestingly, in the original staging of the stock transformation sequence, we were always going to see Battle Cat's face prior to his armour appearing. I've actually showcased this piece of production artwork on numerous platforms over the years. Going back to the Masters of the Universe series Bible, shortly after Prince Adam has become He-Man for the first time, his sword fires a bolt of power into the skies. The power ricochets off the ice mountains and strikes Cringer, who at the time is running through the forest with Teela. Cringer, away from Teela's eyes, becomes Battle Cat and races to He-Man's side. Whilst that would have made for a visually impressive origin, it would have been rather quick and lacked all the character work that we have seen develop in this version of the story. Thus I'm thankful on this occasion that the events of the series Bible, which were only truly a guide and never set in stone, were not followed to the letter. The sorceress has a surprisingly strong presence in this episode. When the Gage escapes, she decides to go investigate herself, which seems like an overreaction since He-Man has dealt with similar monsters before. However, DC Fontana needs the sorceress at the battle, not because of the Great Beast, but because she needs her to communicate with He-Man. Because Teela named Cringer earlier, we wonder how Battlecat will be identified. The sorceress talks to He-Man through telepathy and reveals his partner's name, to which he smiles. She says that he will need Battlecat's help to save the day, but he does not do anything particularly special. One would think that an episode about Cringer's origin story, Battlecat would be the hero, but he almost immediately takes a secondary role after becoming Battlecat. This actually establishes a precedent for the series. Even though Battlecat is the tough, intimidating, fighting tiger, Cringer is the one that gets the best scenes and dialogue, although for the record check out the episode Valley of Power for some truly wonderful Battle Cat scenes. I do love the other's reaction upon seeing Battle Cat for the first time, that reveal of the pair together perfectly showcases just how wonderful the pairing of He-Man and Battle Cat is. The artists, the creators at Mattel really did something special. Battle Cat is one of the most frequently used characters in the He-Man series and yet he is almost never the centre of attention. Cringer gets a few starring roles such as A Beastly Sideshow and Frady Cat, but none reveal more about him than this episode Battle Cat. 1985 is a good year for discovering familiar characters anew with this instalment and, as I have mentioned before, Origin of the Sorceress, both episodes revealing unknown pasts. The plan to capture the Gedge is fairly straightforward. He-Man just has to lead the beast back into the temple so that man at arms can blast the rock and seal the door. The sorceress who flies over the battle as Zor and tells all the heroic warriors what to do orchestrates the whole scheme. Again, the situation seems too ordinary to require her intervention. The scene is reminiscent of Return of Evil in which Zor oversees another battle. The Gedge throughout this final scene seems to go from menacing unknown entity to a pit of a klutz, going back and forward, grabbing at thin air, getting lost, falling over. 
Granted, it's supposed to showcase He-Man and Battle Cat's teamwork, but it does greatly undermine this ancient being that prompted the sorceress to leave Castle Greyskull. One final interesting little bizarre fact, the original script had a completely different ending. After Teela rebukes both Prince Adam and Cringer for leaving during the Gedge's attack, Man Arms talks to his daughter about the Gedge, revealing that the ancient magic that kept it in prison was disturbed by their archaeological dick, enabling the creature to escape. After Man Arms and Teela leave the tent, Prince Adam talks to Cringer, the giant cat hoping that he will never have to become Battle Cat again, but both he and Prince Adam acknowledge the fact that he probably will, again and again. There is a weird sense of foreboding. It's not the happiest of endings. Also, the weird thing about the ending is that it stays within the flashback, so we never come out of the flashback, which is really bizarre. I want to highlight this end scene because it's truly beautiful and somewhat transcends the series. As Man Arms questions where Battle Cat came from, He-Man looks to the skies at Zor, laughing to himself. Given that we have been on this journey with the characters, we can understand why He-Man finds humour. The cowardly cringer is now the mighty Battle Cat. It's unbelievable. And just when we think that the ending is perfect, we come out of the flashback and have the most perfect of scenes. And I would never have become that awful Battle Cat! Oh, I'm glad you did, old buddy. Without Battle Cat, He-Man would be a lonely fella. Oh, gosh, I, I, I guess I'm stuck with it. The story actually seems to forget about Orko's initial role in favour of Adam and Cringer, who are the heart of the episode. And let's be honest, all of our hearts truly melt when the two share a loving embrace. There is a real sense of the closeness and the bond that these two share. They provide the magic that makes this episode special. The intense love between them immediately captures our hearts. We know that this will be a lasting friendship and that their relationship will go from one of owner and pet to one of friend and friend. It appears that Cringer becomes more human-like with age, gaining the ability to speak and attaining human attitudes and qualities. While most He-Man episodes make us laugh or smile at Cringer, this episode makes us utterly love him. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.